All right, thank you so much. So for today, um, this presentation will be done by my colleague, Dr. Nendengo and I, and we'll be focusing on our mapping project on pesticide use in Ventura County. Uh, we will highlight the health impacts of different pesticide use in the county. We will also focus on areas with high application volume of hazardous pesticides and present you know, evidence of social and economic justice issues associated with um, pesticide exposure. So just before you know, I dive into what we did and why we embarked on this project, you know, this slide shows us one of the final products of our project, which is the map. You know, later in this presentation, my colleague Dr. Nendengo will be working us through what information you know, one could derive you know, using the map. We have a report on the EWG website about this research. And this was also published in the Ventura County Star um, newspaper. So apart from our findings in the newspaper, you know, community residents you know, shared their health experiences with pesticide exposure. You know, here on this slide, we present a direct quote from a farm worker saying, when they sprayed, my body would be red, swollen and itching when I get home. That is not normal. So why this project? I know that's one of the questions everybody will have in mind. Numerous epidemiological studies you know, found that proximity to the pesticide spread field is associated with health harms in children as well as in adults. You know, this slide kind of highlights um, some of the health impacts observed in children. You see that at half a mile, away from the fields, um, respiratory problems and reduced cognitive function have been observed in children. At 1.5 miles, evidence has shown an increased risk of autism and cerebral palsy among children. As far as 2.5 miles away from a crop field, there has been evidence of you know, increased um, risks of cancers a smaller birth weight among um, children. So for adults, increased risk of cancers such as um, breast and prostate cancers have been associated with um, pesticide exposure. There is also evidence of Parkinson's um, disease. So hence, with all these epidemiological evidence, you know, we conducted a semi quantitative research about um, pesticide use in Ventura County, you know, with the following research questions. First, what pesticides are applied and where? You know, what are the health effects associated with those pesticides? What pesticides are applied together that have the same health effect? How close are homes and schools to fields where pesticides are applied? Are there disparities in pesticide exposure and risks? So to answer these um, questions, we actually obtained pesticide use data for the years 2015 to 2020 from the Ventura County Agricultural Commissioner. You know, these data are reported based on township sections of approximately one square mile. We overlay the crop map, maps, you know, with land sections to accurately identify the locations of pesticide application in each um, township section. You know, based on the data, more than 350 pesticide active ingredients were used in Ventura County you know, during the period of 2015 to 2020. Then we examined um, the toxicity, you know, of this pesticide using authoritative data sources, you know, such as those from government agencies and um, peer-reviewed literature. 
all health uh, effects you know, found were combined to calculate a toxicity index for each pesticide. We also calculated a toxicity weighted pesticide use, which considers both pesticide toxicity and the quantity of pesticide um, applied. Um, finally, we also analyze the social and economic situation of communities that are most exposed to pesticide application. So for this, we um, use demographic data from the American Community Survey for the years 2015 to 2019. And using area proportioning these demographic characteristics, we are assigned to each township um, section. So the map we are seeing here actually shows the distribution of the total volume of pesticides applied across township um, sections. So what are our key findings? On average, more than 5 million pounds of pesticide were used every year in Ventura County. More than 1 million pounds of 61 pesticides linked to cancer were applied each year. You know, we also found that 33 elementary schools are within a quarter mile of pesticide spraying areas. And finally, almost 70% of homes in Ventura County are within 2.5 miles of pesticide use um, areas. Now looking at you know, the individual key findings, this table um, highlights the different health effects found to be associated with um, pesticides. You know, the total number of pesticides for each health effect and some specific examples of pesticides. Now here, looking at the table closely, you see that some pesticides have uh, multiple health effects, such as methane and captain being associated with an increased risk of cancer and endocrine um, disruption. Another example is a telon 1,3 dichloropropane. Now this particular pesticide is associated with an increased risk of cancer and um, respiratory toxicity. Just like I mentioned earlier, we also found over 100 elementary schools and nearly 200,000 residences to be within 2.5 miles from croplands in Ventura. You know, the table we are looking at shows us how these schools and residences are being distributed based on the distance to um, cropland. For example, we saw about 31 residences and 33 schools to be within a quarter mile of um, croplands. So to understand um, communities, you know, exposed to pesticide application, as I said previously, we downloaded data from the American Community Survey and using area proportioning, demographic characteristics were assigned to each section and sections with pesticide use were divided into five groups. That is a quintiles. So this table, shows us the five groups, a group of sections with no pesticide use reported, the total um, number of sections in each group, and the total population for each group. Now looking at the table closely, you know, you can see clearly that there are differences, you know, between sections where pesticides are applied and sections where pesticides are not applied. You know, in the sections where pesticides were applied, you see that the total population for the quintiles is fairly um, similar.
So this map um, shows us the distribution of the toxicity weighted pesticide use. Remember, this actually considers pesticide toxicity and the quantity of pesticide applied. You know, so the map is showing us the distribution of the text um, of the toxicity weighted pesticide use across township sections. The darker purple coloration, you know, indicates areas with a higher volume of pesticide associated with, um, with higher health risks. So these areas here that are darker um, in colorations have higher hazardous um, pesticide um, applications. So one thing we need to actually note is that, you know, Pesticide exposure is a social and economic justice issue. You know, based on our analysis, we, we found that areas with more hazardous um, pesticides have lower per capita income, you know, compared to areas with um, less hazardous pesticide. So what does this mean? This simply means that in groups of sections with the least hazardous pesticide use, per capita income is higher. Now in the group of sections with the highest hazardous pesticide use, per capita income is lower. So you see that communities with the greatest um, pesticide exposure are uh, also those that experience economic um, difficulties. So likewise, we found a um, greater percentage of the population without a high school diploma in areas with uh, a greater volume of hazardous you know, pesticides. You know, these findings, you know, reflect that, uh, reflect the social injustice, you know, happening in areas with greater pesticide exposure. You know, these areas are also areas with less access to educational resources and social support necessary to achieve high school level education. You know, the, the shortage of um, educational resources um, is also closely associated with economic difficulties. So more so, we actually saw a greater percentage of the population with no health insurance in areas with a greater volume of hazardous pesticide. So um, the people who are most exposed to the harmful health effects of pesticide application often do not have access to basic health resources you know, for timely diagnosis, and treatment of acute and um, chronic health um, conditions. So finally, uh, we, we found a greater percentage of Latinos and African-American community members in areas with a greater volume of hazardous um, pesticides. As we all know, the Ventura County community has long been aware of the environmental injustice in the happening in the county, with people of color being the most exposed to toxic chemicals. Our research, that's the EWG research, shows this tragic um, disparity. We hope that with you know, these kind of studies, you know, such as the one we have currently, greater resources and environmental justice will be reached for all these communities. So in mapping out areas with the most hazardous pesticide use, like I told us when I, when I started, the Quinto 5 are just group of sections that have the highest volume of hazardous um, pesticides. So in mapping out those areas, so this map kind of shows us where those areas are being located in the county. Then this other map here highlights, highlights those areas 
you know, with the most hazardous pesticide use that have more than 5% of Black or African-American population. So in the map, you could see that those areas are indicated by, um, by yellow um, borders, like we see here. So these areas here um, do have um, greater than 5% of Black or African-American population being exposed to, you know, greater volume of hazardous um, pesticides. So with all these findings, what do we at EWG recommend? So we need to, first of all, prohibit the use of the most toxic um, pesticides, reduce pesticide use near schools and childcare centers, you know, we need to advance notifications of spraying events. And finally, we need to protect um, economically vulnerable um, communities from exposures to pesticides. So with a lot of community, you know, residents listening to us today, one question, you know, one could have is, okay, what can I do today, right? Um, so for your community, you need to report any form of pesticide, um, pesticide um, drift event. And for your family, you need to always, you know, take your shoes off, you know, before entering your home. And for the future, you should always make your voice heard, you know, asking for, advanced notification of pesticide spraying events and limit um, pesticide um, spraying near schools. So with that being said, I'm gonna be passing on to my colleague, Dr. Nendenko, to give us a walkthrough on the map. Thank you so much, Dr. Oche. I would like to mention that uh, uh, I'm sure all the viewers have many questions about the powerful uh, scientific data that Dr. Oche presented for us. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat and we look forward to a very robust discussion. So I will now do a share screen on my side and introduce some of the functionalities of the AWG a map that displays pesticide use. So um, we are looking at, uh, at a page on AWG website and uh, all of materials about Ventura County Pesticide Mapping Project are available in both English and Spanish here are examples, and that is the original report that was written by several WG scientists. This report is available in English and Spanish, uh, and so are all the features of the map. So um, I will be, as I am going for the map, I will go, will be going for the Spanish and English version. So the map has two functionalities. One can look at the fields where the colors reflect uh, individual fields with the red more intense color showing more uh, greater quantity and more hazardous pesticides. And uh, yeah, orange and yellow means less hazardous, but still of concern. And then the map view showing residential areas, it we can zoom in and see some of uh, the Purple color here is showing us schools, and the coloration on the residential areas is reflecting how close to the pesticide sprayed fields a home or a group of homes may be. So the same view in Spanish, um, view of residential areas. What I wanted to share as an example is that one can search by address. It's the same search bar. Um, and I will go for Oxnard High School. And that will zoom me in to the area of the high school. 
This is in the residential view. So of course, right here are the fields. And tragically, as of course, residents of Ventura County know, uh, a very large number of schools, from schools for the little ones to all the way to uh, high schools and places of higher learning are very close to the pesticide fields. Now, I hope that everybody can explore the map on your own. I will just share that it also has a functionality where somebody can click on the residential area and information will come up. Um, same information in English and Spanish. I will do the same uh, click on uh, a box. So the information that comes up if one clicks in an area near uh, perhaps a school or one's own home location, so there is information about which pesticides have been sprayed within two and a half miles with a period of six years among them. What are the pesticides of highest concerns? For example, Dr. Uche mentioned the pesticide metam and the pesticide captan, uh, both pesticides of high concern and then um, what different pesticides can do as far as the health impacts. So I would love to stop sharing here so we can all see each other. Uh, when we come to the question and answer period, I certainly will be glad to present more of the navigation. And we already see the first question in the chat. Thank you so much. Mr. Hancock was talking about what are some of the less harmful alternatives? Well, there could not be a better transition period because right after me is coming our next and final uh, speaker from the speaker lineup, Mr. Ron Whitehurst, uh, who will talk to us exactly about this question. So, Mr. Whitehurst, are you able to unmute yourself? Yes. yes. Thank you, everybody. Keep the questions coming in, and we'll come to them after Mr. Whitehurst's presentation. Very good. Um, my name is Ron Whitehurst, and I'm a pest control advisor and uh, co-owner of Rincon Vitova Insectaries. Since uh, 1950, we have worked with uh, farmers to reduce their pesticide use, to get off of the toxic materials, and to set up uh, biological control approaches to controlling the pest. In other words, working with nature instead of trying to beat her into submission. We don't need any toxic pesticides to grow our food and fiber and medicine. So our um, uh, 60, 60 plus years of, of experience as a company, you know, uh, we've demonstrated that over and over again. So uh, we have many ways of, of controlling the pest, but the most important one is to grow uh, healthy plants and healthy animals. And uh, so they have a strong immune system and can uh, fend off uh, pests and disease uh, without the use of any uh, pesticides whatsoever. So uh, as was stated earlier, we need to ban toxic pesticides and I think we need to promote agroecology and we need to buy local organic food. Agroecology is an ecological approach to uh, growing food that virtually eliminates any pesticides, toxic or otherwise. In uh, sustainable pest management work group that I'm in, um, the governor set up this work group to look at what is the future of pest management and so I'm one of um, 25 stakeholders uh, representing a broad base of, of consumers, uh, farmers, uh, um, EJ groups, and um, uh, tribes that are trying to come to a, com a, a consensus of, of what do we need to do to manage pests and have a healthier environment. So, a number of us are, are pushing for a systems approach, looking at agroecology versus what's the next less toxic pesticide. So we've got language in the, the draft recommendations to that effect. And so we're hopeful that um, when this uh, gets to the governor, um, I think uh, it's slated to go to him in, in June and then uh, have a big, um, um, uh, presentation in, in August um, that uh, will 
be able to strongly encourage the governor and the legislature to, to move forward with reducing the amount of toxic pesticides in our environment. Our, our president, President Biden, is calling for a moonshot for reducing cancer. Taking cancer causing pesticides off of registration with EPA, in other words, banning all the carcinogenic pesticides would be a good start. So write to him if you know anyone who has cancer. The Environmental Working Group uh, formulation of the Department of Regulations pesticide use reports is a good start, but it doesn't include all of our exposures to toxic pesticides in our environment. It doesn't include Caltrans and oil field herbicide use. Oil service companies that service the oil wells are required to keep the weeds down to reduce fire danger around the wells. So they use a toxic cocktail of herbicides to keep the weeds down. So with no weeds there, the soil is bare. And so when the wind picks up, uh, the um, dust goes into the, the air, picks up the dust, and um, they cause respiratory problems for the neighbors. There's a similar problem with Caltrans where pesticide laden dust along the uh, side of the roads and freeways is whipped up by passing cars. In upscale neighborhoods, uh, lawn care and pesticide service companies create a toxic cloud of pesticides. Cities and counties use toxic pesticides in our community spaces. So the picture presented by Environmental Working Group, it's bad, but it, it could be that it's actually worse than presented there. Some pesticide advocates and, and salesmen say that, oh, okay, so now we're using increasingly um, lower risk materials, such as sulfur, oil, and the fifth generation pesticides, the ones that have been developed that are, have very low human toxicity, at least acute toxicity. That's a good, good start, a good point. But now we learn that some of these, these fifth generation pesticides like neonics, uh, such as imidacloprid, are endo endocrine disruptors. That means they interfere with our sex hormones, possibly a cause of gender dysphoria that we see in our youth. At Roundup in our conventional wheat notes, food chemicals, fabric softeners, fire returns, sanitizers, and we're building up this toxic load on our body's support system. It's time to walk on the path to a healthy life. Tell your elected representatives that you want your city to use non-toxic and low-risk approaches to controlling pests. San Francisco and Santa Monica are some good examples of cities that are on their way to doing that. Tell your state and federal officials that you want agriculture to be our approach to, to, uh, to yeah, we want agroecology to be the approach to agriculture that virtually eliminates the use of toxic pesticides. Show up at your city council meeting, the school board and the HOIs, the uh, homeowner association meetings. Tell them what you want. We have a problem with money and politics, a revolving door between the regulated industry and regulators. We've got university and extension generally behaving as if they're the marketing arm of the pesticide and fertilizer industry. We need to balance that influence with people power, a loud voice calling for sanity in regulating pesticides. There's a light at the end of the tunnel though. Governor Newsom wants healthy food and a healthy environment. We need to have his back. California deregistered chlorpyrifos. A number of my friends were helping with that program. And this is a deadly brain sucking pesticide, still available in 49 other states. But this shows that we have the ability to select what we want to use in our fair state of California. We have the knowledge, we have the tools, we have the ability to create a paradise on earth. If we as a culture to start moving in that direction. So I appreciate Environmental Working Group um, 
with their putting on this wonderful study and, and organizing this information so it's accessible to people and for um, and AACP to uh, to host this this presentation today. And I'm open to any questions that that people have. Thank you so much, Mr. Whitehouse. We do have lots of questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Susan Klein, for asking for the links for the map. The links are now in the chat, both for English and Spanish version. And uh, Mr. Mark Hancock's uh, opening question really, uh, Mr. Whitehurst uh, uh, covered it very well. So I'd love to go to Ms. Ruby Duria's question. And what are some of the pesticides we can use in our homes? Because indeed, as I would describe, an enthusiastic homeowner can go to a local hardware store and see some of the world's sort of most toxic pesticides right there, lined up right at the entrance. How is that enthusiastic homeowner to know that actually those chemicals with names like Roundup and 2,4-D and other things that, uh, you know, even a college graduate will stumble while, while trying to pronounce. So there are kind of two questions here. One is, how do we know that it's sold in the store? Surely it must be safe. That's kind of common approach. But the other is, I suspect that pesticide companies are cheating while telling me their products are safe. What do I do? I am a hobby gardener. Uh, bugs are eating my favorite flowers. What options am I looking for? So Mr. Whitehurst, if you're up for to take this question on. Sure. How long do we have? <laughs> um, um, but, but we've got about three minutes. <laughs> um, so we can get to other questions. The, the first thing is to grow healthy plants. And so use compost for fertility. And then um, um, uh, if you have uh, pest problems, uh, we're not against spraying. Just spray with, with things that are non-toxic. First thing is take your garden hose and physically spray the, the insects off the plants. And then you do that a couple of times. If you need something stronger, uh, put about a teaspoon of uh, dishwashing detergent in a quart of water and spray that on. And so there's a number of, of things that you can you know, just literally pull off the shelf in your kitchen that are, make uh, dandy pesticides and pest repellents. So um, um, garlic, hot pepper, and soap are some fantastic uh, insecticides. And um, we've got at least a millennium of used history for those things. Uh, yes, the pesticide company uh, has gamed the pesticide registration process. Um, a good example is, is um, Monsanto uh, hired IBT labs in the uh, Chicago area to do some toxicity testing on uh, Roundup. And um, they, um, uh, it turned out that they, they faked a lot of the data, and so the uh, toxicity uh, studies that are the foundation for the most widely used uh, pesticide in the country are, are fraudulent. And uh, they agreed to redo them. They have not done that. And so we don't really have good data. And so uh, there's a, a, a suggestion that we should go with the science. And uh, the pesticide companies have distorted the science uh, to promote their profits. And so uh, the best thing to do is to avoid the toxic pesticides and learn uh, more about organic gardening. And um, uh, that is the best approach to deal with the pest on, in the home. There's um, a lot of IPM information on the web and non-toxic and low-toxic uh, things that lots of YouTube videos on how to control pests without using toxic pesticides. And right to farm, yes. Um, farmers need some kind of protections, but, but uh, not protections to use the toxic pesticides. So if they're legal, um, they can use them. So that's the angle that we need to focus on is taking the toxic pesticides off of registration so they're not available to be used legally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitehurst. I'd love to pose the next question to my colleague, Dr. Uche. 
and I can share that I have had uh, the pleasure and the good fortune of working with Dr. Uchi for the last two years in her position as environmental health postdoctoral research fellow at Environmental Working Group. But Dr. Uchi, as you came to this project, um, what would you describe as most surprised you about the findings for Ventura County? And what, what is like one key thing that you would like uh, our today's audience to remember? One moment, we need to make sure Dr. Uchi is unmuted. She should be. Yep, no. Yes. Okay, yeah, this now works. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Nindenko, my colleague, um, this is a very important question. And for me, you know, um, seeing that most of these pesticides that community residents are being exposed to are very hazardous, you know, in terms of each of them having multiple health impact associated with them was really surprising. And the uh, most surprising one is how people of color and people who do not have adequate ex access to economic resources are being, you know, exposed to these um, hazardous pesticides. So for me, I think the community residents need to understand the fact that um, they need to make their voices heard. They need to um, advocate for ban or restrictions, limitations, restrictions of um, use of hazardous pesticides because not just are we exposing ourselves, we're also exposing our children. We're also exposing even our born kids to these pesticides, which will have long-term effects on them, right? And nobody's, nobody wishes for his or her child to be sick long-term. So we need to actually ban or limit the use of this hazardous pesticide to protect the vulnerable population. Thank you so much, Dr. Uche. And again, uh, we have lots of questions. I would love, if we are scrolling down for this very lively chat. I would, I would like to come uh, to the question posed by Ms. Maureen McGuire about pesticides and gender dysphoria. Respectfully, you know, Oloma and I are experts in public health and toxicology. So I would, uh, with everybody's permission, decline to give feedback on uh, sort of a question from the psychological and psychiatrical sciences. But what we can comment on is that in toxicology and epidemiology, there is a tremendous amount of research showing that indeed exposure to toxic chemicals does have very subtle but a profoundly harmful long-term effects on the development of the reproductive systems. Uh, this effect has been particularly documented for baby boys. Now, linking any particular exposure, is it a pesticide spray event that happened two years ago when a couple was planning to start a family? That is genuinely difficult. But overall, as epidemiological research adds up, what we are seeing as public health experts is that that link between pesticides and other chemicals with endocrine disrupting properties and then impact on the development of the reproductive system and the hormonal balance that is detectable in the lab. And surely, you know, hormones are both the uh, gender specific hormones and just overall metabolic hormones like thyroid, they impact all of our lives. They're one human, including behavior, including physiology. That's why in Dr. Uchi's earlier slide, we had a listing of pesticides associated with endocrine disruption. There is dozens of pesticides uh, in that list. So for sure, pesticides and our endocrine balance are not friends. That much science is 100% clear. So um, uh, rolling down, so thank you. Uh, uh, the question about the local jurisdiction in curbing pesticide use, I would posit that conversations like today conversation with local residents and also hosted and um, really advanced by a local community advocacy organization is an essential step one because uh, for the community voice to be heard as Dr. Ucha highlighted in her slide, there are sort of many things that can be asked for. If there is going to be a pesticide spraying event, families in the area deserve to know. And they deserve to know in advance as they plan their outdoor activities. 
um, California as a home of Silicon Valley surely should be able to figure out an advanced electronic notification by text message when a cancer or endocrine disrupting uh, linked pesticide is going to be sprayed nearby a school or for that matter near home. Uh, so uh, we have a question for Ms. Susan Klein about how do we tackle the cost aspect? Uh, very often one hears, especially from municipal uh, government, when they say, well, we have this area of turf, we have this right away near road, we are going to spray, we cannot afford to pull weeds by hand. I can share my perspective and then I would love to pass to Mr. Whitehurst. Um, my personal perspective is, um, it's like penny wise pound foolish. If you say it's cheaper today to buy a gallon of Roundup and just douse everything around, what about the long-term health effects? That is actually one of the research projects that the WG is pursuing, is that in associated with elevated risk of everything, that's not free, it's not cheap. It is those um, unplanned hospital visits for respiratory problems that a child may develop. Um, it's, uh, well, it's tragically, many of us, likely many people in this audience, uh, know somebody or perhaps a close person who has gone for cancer surgery. If you looked at those hospital bills for cancer surgery, hopefully the insurance paid most of it. Those are not cheap. So to say that we cannot afford not to use pesticide, I would posit it's the opposite. We cannot afford uh, as a community to deal with all the health effects of toxic chemicals, which right now it is individual families are bearing, but the community cost is large. So Mr. Whitehurst, I'll pass to you whatever you would like to add. Very good. I, I you know, second that emotion that um, uh, we need to think um, of, the, of the whole system that um, um, spraying Roundup may be cheap uh, as far as that action, but it has a propagating um, negative effect in, in the whole um, uh, community of residents in that area. Um, uh, Phil Boyce did the, some interesting studies with uh, San, um, Santa Barbara. <clears throat> looking at um, priority uh, areas in a park. Uh, it's called FAERS system, P-H-A-E-R-S. Um, and uh, I can give the link to anybody that's interested. And um, uh, basically there are certain areas in a, in a park where there's lots of, of exposure of children and such to uh, the areas, especially like the areas around uh, the playgrounds and um, uh, in um, the more uh, public areas, sometimes, you know, in the back uh, part of the park, uh, they might be able to use a little bit of Roundup or pesticide, and uh, there would be very little exposure. So, so prioritizing the areas where um, you need to use some kind of uh, herbicide, you know, uh, will minimize the use of herbicides. There's a number of herbicides that are low risk that are made with vinegar, citric acid, and, um, and soaps uh, that uh, uh, can be used as uh, burned down herbicides that are very low risk. And as soon as they um, uh, wash into the soil, they're food for the soil microbes. Uh, one of the problems with Roundup is that um, it kills the beneficial soil microbes that give soil its tilth. And so it makes it harder, more compact. And so you're selecting for the more uh, aggressive uh, hard to control weeds. So you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot by using that. And in a, a community, um, you can say, okay, how much does it cost to, to do this, uh, to, to pull the weeds? And so you can get a group of, of community residents to come together on a, a Saturday or a Sunday and, and pull, the, pull the weeds manually. So uh, they've done that in Golden Gate Park to eradicate uh, certain weeds in the lawn. They just um, handed out a bunch of hose and people just uh, chopped away at them. And um, over a period of a year or so, they eliminated the weeds. So that uh, we can think about social systems instead of you know, these chemicals to solve uh, the problem. 
Wonderful. And I would love to pass to Dr. Oche to take a question for Mr. Hancock about research and alternatives. One, ah, one second, one second. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, that, that is really a very important question. So the answer is actually yes. Uh, we are looking into that um, topic of, you know, doing a research about safer alternatives to, you know, hazardous pesticides. So yes, we are looking at into that topic at EWG. Yeah, and I will, uh, with everybody's permission, I will take the last question about aerial spraying. Um, and uh, it, it is a concern. Like I would say that, you know, just if something is not sprayed from the helicopter, it does not mean that that is safe. Because again, what the WG is finding again and again, as well as many researchers uh, who do epidemiological studies in the state of California, is that pesticides travel a long distance. In the beginning of her talk, Dr. Uchi had a slide showing a summary of epidemiological research that up to 2.5 miles from the sprayer, 2.5 miles is not close, but scientists are finding that there are harmful effects on children's health right here in California, which is where those studies are done. So spraying something for the air, it will travel really far out. You know, there is no such thing as precision agriculture when one talks about this kind of viral spraying. And suddenly that's why WG advocates for, uh, uh, for California to implement this advanced notification programs. And there are some important developments which are happening on the state level. Now, uh, re realizing that this is, is uh, a Saturday afternoon for uh, many people. So I'm going to start taking us to a close of this robust and rich conversation. I'm going to put the links into the map one more time into the chat. And Mr. Stewart, I, if you are willing to say a, a few words to close us up, thank you again uh, into our county and WACP chapter for hosting us today. So Mr. Stewart, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. I just wanna thank everybody that's been on here that uh, gave their Saturday uh, afternoon to participate in this uh, working group. I think there's been some good information about our environment and about the use of pesticides in uh, Ventura County. And that, uh, you know, I've, I've gone to some other briefings myself. And so they don't always tell the story correctly, I guess is the word to use. Uh, they kind of color it and they kind of, you know, twist it a little bit so that they have us believing uh, something that is uh, not so much the truth as we've uh, heard this afternoon. And so again, I just thank everybody for being here for this information and that it is my hope that uh, this will not be the only opportunity, but we will take what we've heard today and take it and try to do some things to fix some of the problems that exist right now in the county. Uh, it's unfortunate that those that uh, don't have the money or have the voice are uh, being harmed. And so it is that community the uh, that, um, Hopefully this will benefit and that we will find ways to do that. Um, and so I guess, you know, one of the things we talked about was that we need to use our voice. But it is my hope that those that are on here will also speak up and make it known their concerns and uh, that there will be uh, changes for the better. And I just want to thank everybody on behalf of the uh, Ventura County chapter of the NAACP. Thank you for being here and thank you for your time. Thank you, everybody, and special thanks for our synchronous translator who has been in the Spanish language room. Really appreciate everybody's time and wishing everybody a great Earth Month, Earth Year, and just to be continued. Thank you, everyone. Good to see everyone.